Not a whole lot changes, so no surprise, we are back at the Museum and Nature Center. The good news is, now I have my own set of keys to the back gate and my own set of keys to the observatory, and I know the disarming code for the burglar alarm. Oh God, guys, this is gonna make this so much easier. So no more chasing down the staff to let us in on Friday for doing the setup work, which is something I'm definitely looking forward to not having to do. <coughs> Standard objectives as we've had in all previous years. We're not only looking at this year's field day, we're looking at future field days and trying to really sustain what we have developed in the last few years in terms of incrementally improving our operations. So, operators and loggers. We need them, obviously. We are gonna make an effort again this year to plug in whoever shows up. And we do have a couple things we have to make up some ground for. And we'll get into that a little bit in terms of specifics in a couple of uh, more frames. We're gonna be 3A, right? We are gonna be 3A again. It's like I say, it's a nice class to be in. It's the major competitive class. I will say, though, that I think I've explained to you that I do have a best friend from work who operates with a very elitist CWQRP unit out of New Jersey, and they're associated with one of the big electronic companies down there that subsidizes their operations, and every year they pick an esoteric category to compete in, and here's a big surprise. They always finish first. So, no shit, I think last year it was 13A QRP. How many entries are there, do you think, in 13A QRP? I think there were four. Here's a surprise. They won the category. <laughs> we don't do that. I like to pick a nice standard denomination or you know classification for us to compete in that I think is worthy of us. And the thing is, it has been proposed that maybe someday we try 4A. And maybe we will. But to me, 4A is a little bit like having a situation where you're trying to kill ants with a hammer and there's too many people in the room, so instead of smacking the ants, you're just smacking each other on the foot. Oh, God. So. Anyway, we get, may give some considerations to changing classes someday. I don't see it Plus, coming anytime soon. Plus, the fact that Terry puts up nine antennas for each station. Right, we can easily power nine four antennas. Right? I don't think we can. <laughs> well, I only bring this up because going back a number of years ago, when we were still on the rise, GNARC proposed to us that we jointly do a field day some year. Except I told them, look, we'd consider that, but you need to come up with an objective because we think we're doing okay on our own at this point. So, if some year, GNARC and we get together and we compete for something like the open title for New England or nationally, I would entertain that, but as long as we're on our own, 3A just strikes me as the logical configuration and something that we can support based on the number of operators that we've got. If you go 4A, you're going to need lots of Well, that's true too. But the other thing though is, is you know what? We could have taken our score from last year, put it in the 4A category, and you know what? We might have actually finished a couple spots up higher because the fact of the matter is, is 4A is a lot of kind of leisurely clubs that just want to have a lot of tents on the air more than it is people trying to compete in a standard class and win. Because 4A probably doesn't have half the entries that 3A does. All right. Recruit new hams and club members. Well, probably the biggest weakness we've got this year is the disappearance of a lot of people that used to run the GOTA operation, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but once again, we're going to be on the warpath for recruiting GOTA operators. We have continued to develop our digital strategy. We're going to do that again this year. We're still trying to work out the details as to how we're going to handle that. We do want to have fun, as we always have, and practical jokes, jokes at people's expenses, snide remarks will always be entertained as they always have been within our organization. I would just caution you to you know, kind of keep it gentle whenever possible. So, let's go to the second slide. So that means the antennas are still going We're to be We're sponsored by Dell. Dell. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that was weird. Uh -huh. This is your second slide, right? Yes. So, no surprise. Well, actually, flip me back one, because I'm not sure now that you mentioned it. Yep, no, we're good. Yeah, you know, it was switching over to uh, display mode. Okay, fine. I know what happened. Yeah. All right, so, basic configuration is still the same in terms of the layout. The CW guys tend to like the solitude and some of the big trees that enable us to have interesting antenna configurations that are down in the upper parking lot area by where all the huge oak trees are. And so we will be going back there. In terms of digital. It does say inside the observatory. This is one of the ones I really didn't edit, but the fact of the matter is, is digital is probably going to be sharing operational time with the 20, 15, and 10 meter sideband tent, possibly the 40 meter sideband tent, depending on how we work out the configuration. But if we do get a nasty blow, or if we get a lot of rain, we will be reserving the right to move inside the observatory, because you don't have to worry about precipitation, and as we discovered a couple of years ago, it's air-conditioned. 
The only negative that we have with it, though, is the conflict of the antenna up on the deck and the possibility that it infiltrates on the station operations that are inside. And we've had some sticky situations in years past. But we will still be having the 40 meter operation in that spot between the observatory and the corral. The 2015 and 10 operation is going to, this year, though, be isolated a little bit more than it has been in the past. I'm going to try and relocate it to a flat spot that's been carved out in the observatory grounds. Now, I warned you about this last year. They've continued to cut down the trees in the vicinity of the observatory. As a tree lover, this doesn't exactly make me pleased, but I will tell you, it gives us a lot more flexibility where we can put up tents. So in order to isolate the two stations a little bit better, there's every possibility that that 2015 and 10 meter operation will be swung around to the other side of the observatory so that if at some point they're operating digital, we get as much physical isolation of the digital operation and basically the observatory between the two tents, which will probably help cut down a little bit on the RF. The GOTA station, oh, you've got to love it. The folks at the Museum of Nature Center, right, as reported by Andy, who checked them out, are getting ready for their annual fundraiser activity. And they've put the tent right where they put it last year. So I don't know if you remember that we put Fred's red tent underneath a huge awning tent that they use for taking admissions, which is really great. You can survive a tremendous downpour or a hot beating sun based on the fact that the tent is underneath the canopy. They're putting the two tents out and the... Uh, and the we're going to have to talk as usual, but the school will be opening up on the same car calendar as always. Okay. And so, school will start on the Monday after field day. I have every reason to believe the tents are back up, but okay. we will have to ask them as we always do. For two refrigerators. Uh, we'll at least have one. That's all I can guarantee. But they are talking about even having a bigger program that they've had in previous years, and they're taking over our downstairs study from the observatory club. So I suspect you will probably see more tents up and more refrigerators than ever before because they're trying to milk that operation for cash. All right. All right, VHF and satellite. Well, sort of a combined operation, but what was pointed out last year is, is maybe we didn't give it enough deference because we didn't have a tent. So what we're trying to do is scrape together enough tents to manage things. So I just want to do a little quick evaluation of the tent situation, because you confirmed you've got all three of the call pockets. I have all three of the call All right, so if the configuration looks like this, so we've got two sideband tents. We've got the CW tent, we've got the GOTA tent, and we've got VHF, right? Total of five tents. But I haven't been thinking too hard, because here's the way it pans out. We got the three club tents, right? Mm -hmm. The thing I keep forgetting is, Adam? Oh, he should be here. He guaranteed me he would be here. He has his own pop-up tent. Oh, okay. That's what I keep forgetting year after year. So if you put this all together and Fred brings his red tent for the GOTA operation, yeah, we've actually got the tents covered. I, I have actually two tents. Like. Drag the other one along just in case. I'm not sure we need the two extras, but one extra just in case. All right. All right. Next slide. And we can just talk a little bit about how the specific operations break up. Okay. So getting much more specific, CW side. One of the club pop-up tents will be used to shelter it. Andy is going to be running the operation as always. <laughs> it, uh, we're a little bit compressed here, I think, on the display, but what the rest of that string is supposed to say is that our principal operators will be Andy, as always, but Adam's ham mentor from Poland is coming over to join us this year. So if you've never heard about him, he is coming over here for the International DX competition that's sponsored by the Radio Sport Club. Is really quite an elite operator, and we're really looking forward to plugging him in as part of the operation. As far as the rigs go, so I'm assuming you are bringing the K3, right? So excellent CW rig. The antenna configuration needs to be tweaked a little bit because next to TA33 it should really say junior. Because what we're doing this year is the TA33 that the club owns and that I own, they're staying at mothballs. We're trying to keep this as easy and lean in terms of putting up the antennas as possible. So the two juniors that we have, because I own one and the club owns one, are going to be deployed in their place. They're a lot easier to put together and take down, and they're a lot lighter to deal with. And really, the gain factor difference is minimal. Also, the booms are a little bit shorter, so they're easier to handle. We are working on rebuilding our two-element our 2 element 40 meter wire beam. We should have it ready by field day. And I inaccurately am describing that as an 8040 G5 RV, but in effect, you're using a variant of it, and that's what the ZS6, they call it. But the other thing that we want to track is generators. Because, look, when Tony decided to move down to Durham, 
we lost not only him on the Gota side, and his son is one of the voices of the Gota ten, but one of the generators disappeared. So the way we're going to divvy this up, and we'll get into a little bit more detail, is we're going to have the standard configuration, but this time John Shapiro has been nice enough to volunteer his Honda 2000 and I, so we got another Honda in the family. But Fred, I wanted to warn you, as I did earlier, your Coleman's in reserve, so yeah. do me a favor and crank the sucker up, make sure it's okay. I have a Generac portable, yeah. but it's a bit fair to start. Right. I mean, I can't start it. I, right. I got it from a friend. He bought it, yeah. and, and he pops his hernia when he tries to. No, you know what it is? They make a very good generator. That's it's what a people have told me. Thing, you know? They tend to use high compression engines, though, as I've heard is one of their weaknesses. Yeah. And by definition, a high compression engine is always going to be a little bit harder to start. And I've heard that about that brand. You can bring a can of starting fluid. Yeah, you know, if you want. But really, uh, how much does the thing weigh? Is this one of the Genox on wheels? No, it's. Uh... Yeah, and how much do you figure? Yeah, 60. That's it? Bring it along, if that's, bring them both if that's the case. But still count on bringing the Coleman in reserve. Yeah, if you want right? to use it, you got to start it. That's fine. Who here needs your Honda? Yeah, I was going to say, right? I'll bring, my, I'll bring my Honda and I'll bring, and it has that reserve tank. Okay. That'll run all day. Okay. What about the one you're trying to give away? You I gave it away. Yeah, who oh. took it in the end, John? What? Who uh, took it? I forget his name. Okay. So, all right, next slide. That Again, that brought to us by Dell. Fireman. <laughs> yeah, he's a member of the club and he's a fireman. Oh yeah. Well, is he a member of us or he's a member he's of GNARC? Member, well, he got your mailing. He got Rob, right. our mailing list. He's the guy that lives over in Greenwich, right? Uh, Thing you're talking about. I, I can't know. remember his name offhand. All right. Uh, it's Rob. Let's see if I can find All right. Take a look at the other operation for the 2015 and 10 meter tent. Again, not a lot is changing except for the fact that we're going to actually be moving at about 100 feet from where it's normally found, a little bit closer to the back of the observatory. So the observatory intervenes between it and the other side band tent. Um, tent gap, there's going to be Adam. But in terms of the lead sort of alpha dog operators, that's going to be Gus. And Matt is going to be with us again this year. So he, of the unlimited voice capacity and endurance, will be along. I'll just add, though, that remember, Matt's a technician. So if you're standing around doing nothing, and if you're one of those people on field day that likes to stand around and do nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're a general, or you're an extra, or an advanced, babysitting Matt is a perfectly legitimate use of your time. So he can get on and operate at whatever frequency he wants. All right? And then he, he does pretty well. Uh, antenna options on this guy. The TA-33 goes up on the roof. But this is the junior model again. I suspect that the time taken to put that antenna up is going to be about one half what it used to be. But what we still need to do is I need to get together with Adam and we need to try out his mast and mounting options on top of the observatory. <coughs> but what I've done is made arrangements so I can go up there this weekend and we can start configuring it and see what we can make out of the situation. But I predict if all works well, maybe with a few U-bolts, a combination of Adam's mast, it may be sort of half its extended length, and just a simple clamping mechanism to the mast that we should work out very well and it'll be a lot easier to put that up than what we've had to expend putting up the TA-33 in previous years. Adam should be, have, have pads to put under the lakes. Oh, definitely, yeah. No. And well, the thing is, though, see, you're seeing it from one standpoint. I'm seeing it from another standpoint because what I may do is that roof tower has not been mounted. I didn't get a chance to put up the TA-33, so it may be that tripod again, but with the extended, no, no, you don't understand me, my tripod, not reinforced by your wooden unit, but my tripod with the mast coming up from it. In which case, I agree, we'll still need the pads but we can recycle the ones we used last year. No, they're gone. Oh, well, yeah, but it's scrap wood, so we come up with yeah. a couple pieces of plywood, okay? Ernest doesn't have any scrap wood at all. No, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Ernest, when are you going to build that new living room furniture based on the stock that you have in your basement, right? <laughs> living room furniture and a couple of new houses. Yep. <laughs> all right. The other thing to tell, too, is the club has purchased a series of Buckmasters over the years, and the objective is to give each station a nice backup capability and flexibility to jump around on the bands. So that operation will have a Buckmaster 80 through 10 available for it, and the other sideband operation that we'll get into that will be principally on 40 will also be prepared that way as well. But for basically generator number two, that's going to be Adams, which, again, he'll basically be supplying most of the equipment for that 10. The only thing is, is we really have to ultimately decide which ring we want to use, and Gus is quite emotionally attached to his Mach 5, which I think is the top of the line Yezu unit. And Gus is going to be advising us in terms of digital efficiency and what's out there for digital as part of what he's going to be doing in running that tent. So we do want to have a fair amount of flexibility in terms of the equipment. 
But what we've also got is Adams uh, IC7000 available. And remember the Club 2 has a Pro 2 that's available. And what we like about it is it has a nice voice recorder in it. So it's possible we may deploy that as well. Okay, next one. Here's the big change. Where did he go? We have John Solomon back this year. All hail John. <laughs> yeah, thousand cues, some people think they're really good. That's hey, you know. It's nothing like having a professional in the business. That's all I can say. So, another one of the club pop-up tents we're going to use. John's going to be running the operation. Lead operators, basically, Kathy and Tom. No surprise, you guys did an excellent job there. But I just want to explain that as we analyze what's required to work out of one of the tents, this is by far the easier operation. Why do I say that? Because we hog a frequency on 40 meters, we stay on it, you press the voice recorder button, and you listen for the calls. Now the thing is, we were playing around a little bit with experimentation on time allocated to digital last year, so maybe we shut down that tent a little bit prematurely. But you would agree with my description of the experience, which is, I showed you what to do in five minutes, I did the first two dozen calls, I gave it to you guys, and for two or three hours, you're working 100 calls an hour. Accurate description, and all you're doing is hitting the voice recorder, and people are coming back to you. So it's a nice operation, and if you like the reward of scoring a lot of points, it's a very easy way to do it. The guys that work their way through on the 20, 15, and 10 operation, that takes creativity and a lot of experience what as a ham contest recorder? operator. Pardon me? What does the voice recorder do? Oh, well, if you've never seen the voice recorder in action, what we do is you arrive there, Bruce. I sit you down in front of the rig. Right. I show you a little piece of paper that says CQ Field Day, CQ Field Day, Whiskey right. One, Echo, Echo. Right. You read it back while I hold the microphone. Okay. It's a digital recorder inside every one of the units that we use. Right. So instead of you screaming through the microphone for 24 hours and making yourself go hoarse, you press the button and you listen to yourself over and over again saying, CQ Field Day, CQ Field Day, CQ Field Day. Okay. And it really works out well. There was a glitch on the logging. There was some... Oh, yeah, that, well. It, it switched on us at the last minute. Yeah, no, no, we did have something happen last year, so I don't know if you remember it, but it's covered for this year because I think everybody's going to be downloading a fresh version of it. Yeah, but last year they added five new areas for what used to be Ontario, Canada, and we're sitting there scratching our behinds going, who the hell are these people and why can't we put their sections in to the software? Pretty sure we got that covered, but it's good that you mentioned it. We will check into that. The other thing is, if you remember, we miraculously discovered that the laptop PC that was bequeathed to me by my daughter was missing the letter Z in the Gumba tent. <laughs> We're probably going to use the same unit, but I've now got a $10 surplus Dell keyboard for us to use outboard. So we should be able to hack our way through that. Generators. John, just make sure you're on time with that generator delivery. What time you want. Well, the thing is, we're going to be setting up on Friday. We'll get into that in some detail. But remember now, I have the keys to the observatory. So what I'd like to do is get as much of the equipment on site on Friday as possible and lock it up. So there's everything's tested. We don't have to go looking for it on Saturday. So if you, be there Friday. I'll be there as early as 9 o'clock. So I'll get to logistics in just a minute. But if you can get it there, that would be great. The other thing that we'd really like to do, though, is incrementally test the rigs as we set them up. So I don't know if you're available to us on Friday, Tom. But if you are, I would like you to do what you did last year follow in our wake and test each of the station I'm configurations. The creek well, that I can understand. <laughs> and the creek's going to be swollen based on recent rains, I can tell you that. All right, other things to consider, though. Again, we're going to be using John's Pro 3, so I'm assuming you'll bring that along. Again, nice rig, the voice recorder. But the whole idea with using the ICOMs is we've always wanted to sort of standardize on one rig so that your skills are interchangeable if you're running from station to station. And really, the Pro 2 operates almost identically to the Pro 3, so it gives us sort of three very predictable and very similar rigs to operate. Two-element wire beam, but with a little bit of a variation, because we're going to be doing a couple of things to make sure it doesn't skew as we put it up like it did last year, is still part of the expectations. Again, another Buckmaster OCF dipole to give it a backup capability, as well as the flexibility to get on any of the bands that we need to get it on. Okay, next one for me. This is the challenge this year. Tony is gone. AT is gone. The good news is, I've already been in contact with bugs who pinged me at the end of April and said, can I still come to field day even without my dad? Yes, you can. <laughs> and in there is a suggestion, do us a favor though, please ask your mom. Oh, I asked my mom and she was quite enthusiastic about it. It's like, God bless us, bugs is back. 
We're not sure how much of a time commitment we're going to get, but much like she did last year, she's also going to try and grab a couple of her girlfriends and drag them along to help us out with the operational side of Gota. Elena, we can definitely use you back. Where's Alan? Because I expect him to be here, and we will be counting on him for contribution. Melissa, the official voice of the voice recorder, will be returning. But the Martin family has gotten an interesting situation on field day weekend. We've got a bridal shower for my son on Saturday and a memorial service for one of the in-laws on Sunday. However, <clears throat> remember that hams are never supposed to operate on field day with any economic incentive. But since I signed my daughter's mortgage note last year, you may rest assured she's coming in to put in hours, even if it's 3 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. But we're going to need a lot of operators. Casual operators who can work in batches of 20, that's great. But boy, if I can recruit a couple of militants that can be there for the full 100 call allocation, that would be even better. You're one of them. <laughs> Make sure you have that expectation, but you were good last year. I think what handicapped you a lot, though, is we tended to put you on late. This year, you're going to be on early, and there's a marked difference when you're running the go attempt the first four or five hours, as opposed to when you're crawling on your hands and knees to pick up a couple incremental contacts on Sunday. So we're going to try and plug you in much earlier this year. Can you get Linda to come? We haven't heard from them. I put in a call to Linda and Janine. I just haven't heard back from them. I'll do it again. Yeah, because we have a club antenna for them. So one of the guys are calling to say, look, we've got the club antenna to put up, and then get over there and say, oh, by the way, what about field day? <laughs> I've called her a couple times. But they're very traditional people, so they've got a good old-fashioned analog recorder that picks up after 28 rings, and I have no idea where they can monitor it for messages because I haven't heard back from them. If you speak to them on an ongoing basis, tell them we're looking for them, and I've got the antenna ready to put up. Okay. 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 All right, so other things. I'm going to be bringing my Honda to power that operation. And in fact, we're trying to make it as self-contained as possible in terms of who brings what. That's where I'm going to be spending most of my time. Again, as we've explained, I have to take it easy on myself this year. And to me, it's probably the best use of my time based on circumstances. And we want to try and milk that tent for every opportunity we got. So. We do need more ops. What we're also handicapped a little bit by is we need to get the five folks under 18 for the 100-point multiplier. True? Yes. So what we got to do is line those people up. We had a couple folks that were sure things that have grown up and are now older than 18. So Bugs used to be one of them. So we need to put our heads together and come up with at least five youngsters. To get that multiplier, it's just one QSO. True? One QSO by each of the operators. Oh. Each one has 20, 20 contact for each one. No, 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 no. Let's not confuse our bonuses. I believe there's one that says to, to a maximum of five operators under 18, one QSO apiece, 100 points. Then it's the 20 call increments that you stack on top of that, but in a different category is the way that actually works out. All right. Operator recruitment will be big here. In terms of the antennas, we've got the 18 donated Buckmaster. That will go up again in its usual configuration. Uh, Andy was just nice enough to complete the, pair, the repairs on an 80 and 40 trap dipole, which I may also be putting up. The rationale behind that is relatively simple. We're going to orient that to basically hit the southwestern part of the country. But what I also want is another option to isolate the antenna that GoTo uses from the antenna that's used when we switch to digital. Because that's the Buckmaster in back of the observatory. And what I noticed last year was if you take a tape, or just to take a measuring tape, it's only about 100 feet from the end of that antenna to the end of AT's antenna. So if we're suffering any blocking problems from the digital station, the idea is we can switch over to the trap dipole, maybe get a little bit better isolation. OK, so that's the thought to go to side. But again, um, we may be expanding hours on that. I intend to be on site probably till midnight on Saturday, maybe 11 o'clock, go home, get six, seven solid hours of sleep, and then come by on the relief crew that shows up in the morning. So that being the case, we may be keeping that tent operating fairly late and or fairly early in order to just milk it for as many points as we've got. This is going to be the difference this year, though. If we run out of operators and people are battle fatigued and Bugs is going to give me 48 hours, then no kidding. When we run out of operators, it's going to be me and Bugs. We'll toss the multipliers out the window and we'll get 500 QSOs out of that tent. But follow me. This is after every other option has been exhausted. You see what I'm saying? And I'd rather take two points for an extra 150 QSOs, then stop at 350, which I think is approximately where we ended up last year. All right? But it's really critical if you have kids, or grandkids, or neighbor kids, or kids' kids, you know, I mean, huh? Can 
Hi. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if you have to know these people, but right. can you put out like an invite to the um, the Fairfield homeschoolers? Actually, that's a great that idea. How would we? Because right. how would we reach them? Uh, I Are you active with them? Because so see, the yeah. museum is associated with those people. I don't know if you've known that. They have a program up there, and it might it might be a great idea. Great. Tom Agustin, though, kind of started that effort. Yeah. And where, who was he working with? His wife's a school teacher, or could you remind me how that worked out? It was just oh, I I have to get something out to, to, for every member to give to your kids to bring in to school. So I better get that out real quick. Right. Talk about the school. We also talk about the Boy Scouts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, too, yeah. Whoever has contacts, please contact them. Yeah. What, do you need a certain age or, no. or just any child who may be under 18? Under 18. Under 18. Under 18. Under 18. Under 18. Just, you know, you need over 18, under 18, yeah, it doesn't matter. But it's relatively easy for us to find five under 18 operators to pick up that one multiplier. Right. You know, and from there, if they can just understand that we're going to be do, doing something kind of interesting and just accept a five minute explanation as to their limited role, that's really all they need to do. For the Sunday. Well, the thing is, you know, we start on Saturday, but again, what I would like to do is plug in my daughter and Bugs as quickly as possible to rack up their 100 points or their 100 QSOs, if we could do that, and then plug in people as things calm down a little bit later. That's what I like to shoot for, but you know what? I'll entertain any combination that just maxes out the number of QSOs from that 10. It's all said and done. In terms of other people to help me, though, I got Tom Agustin, who will be with me on Saturday. He's committed on Sunday, but hey, Saturday's great. Fred, I'll count on you. Also, Chet, who we hear from on field day every year, I did speak to, he will be with us, and he's volunteered to help me out there as well. But just understand that one of the multipliers we get is based on the fact that there's going to be a full-time GOTA mentor in that tent at all times. So if all of a sudden I spontaneously grab you and you're a general, advanced, or an extra, just sit your butt down in the tent. Because usually, by the time I'm grabbing you, the people that are actually operating the GOTA operation know exactly what the heck we're doing, and all we're doing is borrowing your license class. Right? And just remember, if you observe a rules violation on field day, and you're in a position where you have to stop, what's the simplest way to do it? Anybody can answer this question. If you can answer this question, you're qualified to be the go-to mentor. What do you do? Pull the plug. You pull the plug. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Ernest. <laughs> I took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> sure. So operator recruitment is great. I will tell you, sometimes it gets a little bit like a madhouse in the go-to tent. So occasionally you'll see one of the mentors like me tell everybody, go get yourself some dessert and we'll call you when we need you. And it's great that everybody gathers around because that's what we're trying to impress people with is the nature of the hobby. But I will tell you, things can get hectic every now and then. So sometimes we clear the tent. Don't take it personally if you're asked of a moose and take a couple people with you to go get them refreshments or show them another station. All right? Okay, you can flip it. The satellite operation and the VHF operation. We gotta get a hold of Jim Marcus. He volunteered to be with us last year. You haven't heard anything from Jim recently, I have you? Seen her I mean he's hair. back local. Yeah. Does your son ever run into him or Oh yes, every day. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, well, we have someone that can go and just grab him if necessary, then if that's the case. But we need to talk to him. He's got a good satellite rig. He's got a satellite antenna, as do I, if we need to put it together. But we're gonna be doing a little reduction though for the point of for sake of ease of organization. Because what the club did actually expend uh, some bucks, about $100, on buying a uh, used beam for six meters that was in pristine condition. But you know what? We've put it up for three years, and I don't think we've made 10 QSOs on the thing. So all we're doing this year is we're putting up the six-meter PAR antenna, which has done very well by us. But we are going to make an effort to sort of legitimize that operation by having its own tent, make it a little bit more comfortable, and enlist a series of operators to go in there and operate with it. But like I say, whether or not we get Jim Lau to do the satellite operation remains to be determined. It's always great to have the demo. It's always interesting to see. But the fact of the matter is, is we've never picked up the 100 points once. So if we can pull it off, that's great. If not, it's not going to put us in any worse situation than we've been in any other previous year where we've tried but have never hit a satellite. Two years ago, two or three years ago, we did very nicely with the VHF. We got close to 200. Yeah, the band was Q open. QSOs, yeah. uh, about 150 of those were, were voice, 50 of them were CW, uh, mostly on six meters. Now, in terms of equipment, that my FT897 would do well Yes. for that. So it does sideband and you know, sideband and CW on, uh, on six meters and two meters. So. If you want to drag that along, that would be yeah. great. I mean, the other option we've got is the Pro 2 with the voice recorder, but that's only going to cover us on six. Right. Okay. Plus, now, the other thing is, 
Just plug in your guy, Andy, for a minute, because you're talking about your summer camp guy. The fact that he's a VHF guy. Summer camp friend who uh, WB2 EMR who wants to teach, stopped by last year and wants to operate this year. He can do CW, he can do sideband, he likes VHF. He's kind of an all-around guy. So it um, sounds like he's going to be here. Actually, you know, the plug tune might be a better choice because the internal antenna tuner covers six meters, right? Yes, on the, on the Pro yeah. 2. Because my the antenna tuner I have on the 897, right. I think it's the LDG 8897. Okay. I forget whether it covers six meters or not. I'll check. I will tell you, though, characteristics of six meter antennas that are well put together yeah. is that you really have the band width with that par to cover everything from 50 megacycles flat up to the outer ranges of where you do the sideband operation and probably never have to use the tuner. I will tell you though that unfortunately the PAR took a catastrophic fall during one of the snowstorms this year and I have to check it out for its mechanical integrity. So at some point, Ernest, I may come by your place and we may stick the thing in a vise just to force the element back into position. But I think it's going to be serviceable. Is there? Yeah. For the satellite stuff? Yeah. If Tim can commit, he should, we should do a demo like 90 minutes before the pass. Right. So people can see what it's, you know, get an eyeball to your setup and yeah. demo what it is. We're not demoing satellite when we're trying to actually make contact. Yeah, I would agree. Would that work for our class? Yes, it would. The class? So, so if you can do a demo on the satellite, that would be a class. Right. Well, by default, he in, does a demo on it because he shows you what yeah. he's doing. So. In theory, though, the demo's got to be hands-on. So, I mean, you know, we can discuss that. But, you know, if he's going to do that, then we really have to find a way to get four or five set of hands involved with it. And that was just the, the switch that they did in the rules going back six or seven years ago. They didn't want anything pass in the lecture anymore. So if you remember the first year we overcome that, it's when Ernest was doing the demonstration on the knots. We were talking a little bit about other aspects of putting up an antenna, how you tie an insulator on, etc. It's always an option to go back to. But Georgie, how about that summary thing again? Only because it's such a predictable hit every year. Beautiful demo. I just have to. We have what three weeks? Yep. Okay. Hopefully, because I got to order the boards. Okay. See, I didn't realize what you were doing at that point. Whether you were just using scrap boards or what the story was, because I've actually never seen the demo. I've always been oh, doing okay. something else. Well, I'll order them tonight. Okay. Cool. They should hopefully come in uh, two weeks. All right. What, what do you think you're talking about money? Because we can reimburse this for the whole shoot match or 10 bucks a pot? Look, 10 bucks, 10 boards. Oh, fine. Okay. I used 10 boards for the last two years. So. Get a receipt. All right. We'll have no problem with reimbursement. All right. You won't see it this year either. You need big magnifying. Look, it's not big what the, the boards look like and, and the items we're putting on them. <laughs> if, if there's any glitch, right. I can do win link because right. I have to send 10 win link messages from the location, right. so we'll have, we can we can have each person do a win link message and then we can, that would be hands on. That could work. Yeah. 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 And we can do both. Yeah. If, there's, if there's going to be more than one optimal sa uh, satellite pass in the right. two days, right. you could use one of those passes as, a, as the work hands on thing to let people get the experience of following it. I don't object to that principle, but since we've had such a bitch making the contact in the first place, well, I'd be thankful for one. However, if conditions are really favorable, I don't have a philosophical objection to that. Or just doing it anyway, regardless of what we count it as being the official demo slash lecture either, or you know, as an alternative. So, okay, next one. I think we're just about to the end here. Okay, bunch of good rigs as usual. So I'm bringing my Pro 3. John Solomon's bringing his Pro 3. Adam's going to bring his Icon 7000. Uh, we've got the Pro 2 in reserve, and again, John's on board with pledging his 897. We got Andy pledging his Elcraft 6.3, or uh, K3. This is a good collection of rigs. Also understand, though, that Gus is going to embellish it by bringing his Yezu Mach 5. We did officially ask Gus, are others going to be allowed to play with your toys? And what did Gus say? Yes. Yes. <laughs> we did, by the way, see Gus's mega station. A couple of you know how this operation works. What did you think of it when you saw it? Oh, my god. Um, I mean, three top-line rigs. Everything fed by ladder lines, and he's got this switching complex in the back of this room. It's, it's all automatic relays and stuff. It's unbelievable. And he's got, what is it, five or eight antennas up? I mean, 
when you go outside and walk around his grounds, he's, prob what, he's got probably two acres. And no matter where you are looking up, what you're seeing is an antenna. Mm -hmm. And maybe some trees, but you're seeing a couple of antennas. You know? Basically all V-beams pointing in directions, and the V-beams support each other. It's really something to see. Yeah. All right. Like I say, on the VHF station, we're still trying to line things up. But really, as we were indicating, your 897 would cover the bill there. So I think we're pretty well set there as well. Okay. Let's take it from there. OK, really, we're just rounding things out. But I wanted to point is, here's the four Hondas. Fred, here's your Coleman Reserve. So like I say, I think you started a couple cycles this winter anyway, yes? Yeah. Make sure it's good to go and, and lubed up. All right? OK, next one. What else do we need? <laughs> Well, I'll be bringing my laptop. I'll be bringing a keyboard. It never hurts to have a couple spares. I don't know that we've come to a 100% conclusion on the use of the router, but that's something that we'll debate later on as we go through the more detailed planning meetings that we'll be doing at one of our sort of uh, board meeting number two for the month, where we're going to go ahead and discuss additional strategy. Um, heavy duty extension cords are always good. I have a 100 footer now that is you know, basically industrial quality, but if anyone else has got a 100 footer, a couple hundred footers that would really help, but we are looking for the really thick kind of hundred footers. The ones that you use as your hedge trimmers, feet, that's not what we're looking for. 12 gauge, right? You got it. Um, minimum 14 gauge, but 12 gauge preferable. I think oh, that's great. what my well, configuration well, is. Oh, if you've got one, that'd be great. But it's 50 or 100, I don't know. Okay. No, no, but I mean, even 50. Because you know what? If you can sling a generator between two stations with 50 footers, hey, that's fine too. But ultimately, we need one extender to run the VHF option off the same generator as one of the other stations. And those Hondas can easily handle it, but again, you need the carrying capacity of the heavy duty line. What would the hedge trimmer <coughs> The fact of the matter is the hedge trimmers should be a heavy gauge. Yeah. It's just that people go buy the hedge trimmers like, at Home Depot. Well, I keep like, cutting the cord. Well, that's true, yeah. too. <laughs> but, you know, if you they go start there, off at 100 feet, but they keep taking off 10 feet every time they cut the You know, it's funny how many people <laughs> say that. <laughs> we moved down from Massachusetts. We had one crummy-ass hedge that was four feet long, and we had one of these. I've got a couple of those. Right. And then my father started getting the Black & Decker models, and it's true. Every time you buy a 100-foot antenna, its life expectancy is approximately 10 minutes before cut number one goes into the thing. But no, the fact of the matter is, is most people would recommend a 12 gauge hookup for one of those, but invariably people end up getting 14 and 16 gauges. Boy, you ever want to feel heat? Do your hedge trimmers and then put your hand on the extension cord after a couple hours of operation. Yeah, I've got the orange, you know, those orange cables, those aren't 12 gauge. Or I think yours are. Okay. Your biggest ones are. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely bring them along. On coax. Because of what we've been experiencing in previous years, we continue to increment our own club stock of these guys. So we still got one more 100 foot RG8X that I've got to order that will be here in time for field day. We have a couple that have kind of been getting into the box as strays, but we know who they belong to. We'll be returning them at the end of field day. But you know what? If you do have a fresh length of either 50 or 100 foot RG8X, whether I tell you we need it or not, bring it anyway, keep it in your trunk or in your back seat, just in case. The other article, that we never seem to have enough of is those barrel connectors that go for three dollars a piece. If you've got them at home and there's no particular use for them, bring them just in case we can keep them in reserve. And the funniest thing is, what really kills you these days? Well, you know what? Radio Shack wasn't worth spit for the last 20 years, but up until two to three years ago, you could still go in there and get a barrel connector. Has anybody seen what's left of the Radio Shack operation? If in fact it hasn't been closed down? cell phones and something else that I don't recognize and that's what they're down to selling. So unfortunately Rat Shack could not be counted on for anything these days. They do have, at least the last time I was looking for which was about six months ago, they do have an equipment, it's, it's a series of draws mm -hmm. and they had a lot of barrel, con they used to have barrel connected. But you know what, I think that they were selling all those out as soon as no, they were they, No, they, they were keeping those. Hey, so good I'll news check. if it turns out. Yeah, do I'll that. Check. Do that. All right. Now the thing is, when we try to plug in operators, and we're trying to figure out, you know, where's the peak demand that we seem to have difficulty filling, I just want to caution anybody. If you're an early bird, where we can really use you is sun up on Sunday. And that's what I'm going to be doing this year. So again, I intend to be out of there by 11 or midnight, go home, get a solid six hours sleep, and then come up in time to be one of the relief operators at six o'clock. Gus, God bless him, is also an early riser, and he'll be doing the same thing. But all we've discovered is that no matter how we deploy the overnight resources, they're dead by about 5.30 or 6 in the morning. So if you're an early riser and you want to come up and help us out at that time frame on Sunday, that would be great. 
The other thing that we would tell you is Sunday is always the best time to plug people in who are relatively casual operators, are intimidated by hundreds of people calling at once, and if you want to operate, the time is available. All right. Next. Okay, this is earnest territory, but all I will do will make you the annual reassurance that my wife's hard burning inducing chili will be made again this year. That's my commitment to the food effort. But again, we have emphasized this repeatedly over the last couple of years with limited success that we're looking to embellish the offerings that the club generously puts out there by having people bring in things on a piecemeal basis or on a potluck basis. So if you're a gourmet at doing particular things, bring it. All right? Um, Basically, what that is, sides uh, for dinner time on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Now, can you, can guys, please. Good. What, what did you bring last year that we were so entranced watermelon. by? I'm trying to remember. You did the watermelon, but you had something else too, didn't you? No, Elaine, I'm talking to you. I did. But right. I can't remember what it was. No, it was <laughs> watermelon, <laughs> but there was something else. I remember it. It had to have been good, but I can't remember what it was. Okay. Give me, give me the times of your meals. Six o'clock on Saturday. Okay. Well, we usually eat it around noon on Saturday for the put-up team. Yes. Yeah. That's just. But yes. that's just uh, sandwiches and some. Uh, so, you know. Yeah. So noon and six. We like to keep it predictable for the people that are not operators and just want to come by for the meal. Sunday. <laughs> Sunday is is what's left over from the dinner before and uh, left over from lunch on Saturday. But there is a real breakfast. I will tell you, though, the breakfast is really intended for the operators, but if you show up and there happens to be food, you're welcome to help yourself. But breakfast is usually done by Ernest, and it's done pretty early, so usually by 8, isn't it? Yeah. Is there always enough leftovers on Saturday? Yeah, almost always, invariably. But we could never have too much food, because ultimately, the food goes into John's picnic right, for so our you, refrigerator right, for the picnic. If you're doing leftovers, but what are right. your times for, for your meals on Sunday? So well, Sunday's uh, after, after, well, 8 noon. Basically, yeah. again, yeah. 12 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That may be the last one, but let's see. One more slide? Oh, yeah. Okay. Other stuff. Volunteers for setup on Friday. Well, now remember, I was the one that spotted the rule change that really made me a pleased puppy last year that says you can now start setting up your antennas and your configuration starting at 9 o'clock p.m. on Thursday. Now, it's unlikely we're going to be doing anything productive then. But the rule now states that you have 24 net powers to put up your configuration, which means we don't have to run things close to the borderline in terms of cutoff times on Friday. And when the sun goes down, we can start as early as we want on Friday. Because really, if you extrapolate 9 o'clock on Friday and working till as late as 9 o'clock on Friday evening, that eats into 12 of the 24 hours you have for setup time. So it gives you the opportunity to get things set up well before the critical time frames on Saturday. And we try to take advantage of that. So like I say, though, welcome to the noblesse oblige of yours truly, who has just been made the treasurer of the observatory club. I now have my own set of keys and the code to disarm the alarm. So access to the observatory and the back gate is going to be a lot easier as a result. Now, you're saying 9 o'clock on Friday. That's when I'll be we, there. We used to come in at 4 or 5 o'clock after work. Right. Will you still be Yeah, we can still plug you in. Then, or? Yeah, definitely. We can still plug you in at that point. It's just that what I'm going to be doing is firing some of the pilot lines with the guns, you know, on a yeah. leisurely cycle for others to pull the ropes up with when they show up. The other thing that we're kind of confronted with, and this is where you can help, is we could use your gun in reserve this year. Can you cough it up to us? Sure. And has it been fairly healthy recently? Or? I use it. Okay. What do you get for peak altitude out of that thing? Not that I'm that fussy. 100. 100. The hell plus. Okay. But it's working fine. Yours still uses the funky projectile, though, correct? I use a one-inch uh, shuttle. Right. So, now, how many of those do you have? Uh, I think I've got two or three of them. Okay. I just want to make sure if we lose one in the bushes that you're not going to be, you know, stuck with not having anything. But, yeah, if you could bring that up, that would help. Because we've got my gun, which has been repaired. We've got Frank's gun, which we think has been repaired. But we really have to test fire them both. And I'd like to have a reserve. The good news is, is John's got a heavy-duty slingshot. And Gus is amazingly proficient with his slingshot. He's been told to bring his along I to be in reserve. Shot, my thumb seem to find it all the time. Right. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll have to listen to the repeater. So if people want to check and make sure we're still there. Yeah. What time does, do you start the contest on Saturday? 2 o'clock is when we start. 
And I mean, there's various interpretations. You know, you're free to start later and work later. But 2 o'clock is kind of an ideal time for us to get everything fired up and on the air. What do you mean by that? You say you can start later and work later. Well, you rules know, change, Bruce. I can give it to you in a more like explicit breakdown if you want to see it. But the rest of the club no, has heard I mean, this explanation. What, I, mean, I mean, in other words, they have one now where you don't. I'll show you on the whiteboard. I'm not trying to blow you off, but two, I'll show you two, on the whiteboard when I'm done. From okay. Two, uh, two, yeah, two uh, p.m. to two p.m. Two p.m. Sunday, you stop. That's when the majority of people do it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Other stuff. We always need people on the night shift on Saturday evening. Now we've got the young stalwarts who usually show up, but I gotta get a hold of them and press gang them to make sure they're officially coming. So if you'd like to volunteer for the night shift, that would be great. But again, we emphasize that if you can show up at six o'clock in the morning on Sunday, you're almost as worthwhile in terms of resources if you stayed all night. Teardown on Sunday is always fairly frenetic. It's nice if we have well-rested people, <laughs> if you follow me. So you know what? If you're in a position where all you can do is come Sunday, eat lunch with us to socialize, but then help with the teardown effort, help. That would be great. Because the problem is, those of us that have been up all night are completely wired at that point. We've been known to do some pretty stupid things. So the fresher you are in participating on teardown, probably the safer it is for everybody involved. All right? Let's see if we got anything left after this. Nope, that's it. Questions? Georgie. A couple of years ago, I think somebody tried to get some bonus or extra points by that solar charge. Yeah. Solar I do that, yeah. Yeah, we'll be doing that again. What is it? You have to get um, five Q cells or ten Q cells, I think five, with a battery that's been charged by something other than the electric mains. So what I do is I take one of my batteries. I charge it with a solar panel, I bring it over, we substitute it in, we get five Q cells, and that's it. And it's also the other points, so the messages and whatnot that you had. And yeah. Message the night before. Right, yes. That Friday night, the ARRL sends out messages, a message that we have to copy. They send it by digital, they send it by CW, they send it by voice. Uh, we want to copy those. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the 10 win link messages that I do, that's, uh, that's 10 points each. I, I mean, they have to be messages. They can be NTS messages sent by voice, sent by CW, sent by digital. What we do is there's a crew uh, on one of the win link reflectors who, who get together a list of everybody who wants to receive messages. You just plug that in, you send them your 10 or you know, however many messages, bang, there's 100 points. There's also extra points for sending message to the section a manager, so I do the same thing. I do this a windling message and, and points for sending a message to the, um, the, the Aries uh, head for Connecticut. So I just do that, and you know, there's uh, quick points, 100, something like 200 points total between all those messages. Kudos should go to John because he's exhaustively researched, we researched every multiplier there is, and as far as I know, we've hit every one there is, Everyone with the exception of the satellite operation. Yeah. And there's the what about the what about the logging the software? Said Friday night. Standard stuff, so we'll be still using, what is it, the N3 FJP? It's FJP, yeah. What is it, Fred? N3 FJP? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's what we're doing. Right. And again, we've gone back and forth on whether or not we would be using a router-based configuration. So what you weren't privy to, and it was just kind of evolved and then de-evolved, was Gus had a CW operator he might have brought along with him. And he's the CW operator that was number three with GNARC last year. But this fella is not with GNARC, he's not with us. He's a Romanian fellow that comes to visit. So Gus originally thought that he would come along and operate with us. Turns out he's back to Romania for the summer. With that in mind, the incentive to put up the router-based system, we're gonna have to weigh it. That's all I can say. And it's not something I got a strong opinion on, so we'll just see what happens. We do have, we have all the equipment right. uh, all set to go. There's yeah. a router and a heater, which is I think we've talked to John Solomon. We right. want to check it out, and make sure it's working. Right. The combination that Andy created. Okay. Fred, are you going to send out the current version of the software to the members to begin with here? Uh, well, actually, everybody has to. They can download it if they've used it before. Uh, they have already the information in. If somebody <coughs> wants to download it and they need, and uh, they're going to be using it there, I can send them the password for it. So they can. You can, if you want to put more than five contacts in after practice, I think. Do me a favor, send me the, uh, the uh, I can send you the password. Yeah. Yeah.
Now, what happened last year was, it was kind of interesting, because I think of the three or four laptops we were using, one was the fresh version. And we started to get all those funky Ontario sections. Yeah, there it seems to be one, that one of the log arrangements was like, oh yeah, we see all the sections, and the rest of them are going, where? Yeah. So I would just caution you that it's never a bad idea to do a fresh download. Yeah. Except I don't think there's any sections or rule changes this year, but you never know. Go. No. Yeah, am I going to be able to operate this year? Last year I went up there, I waited around, people were hogging away about it. The only thing she got on was the goal. The year before, Let, I, mean, let's I, got, address this. I got messed up with this. I've heard your question. Let's address this. Okay. It's my understanding, Bill, that despite your pissing and moaning to us at the end of field day last year, that you sat in a 40-meter tent behind Tom. I'm waiting to get on. Uh, listen to me. me. You've asked a question. Nobody You're going to get an answer. If you don't want to wait for the answer, Bill, you're all around. You want to get on, and we make a 